Good evening and welcome to our candidates forum. I'm Alice Pernick. I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters of Larchmont Mamaroneck. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan and we neither support nor oppose any of the candidates. Tonight, we'll be hearing from six candidates who are running in the June primary to become the three Democrats on the ballot in the general election for three Village of Mamaroneck trustee positions. If you are an eligible voter for the Democratic primary, you may vote for up to three of these six candidates. The three winners of this primary will be running in a contested general election in November against three Republican candidates, and we will host a debate in the fall for all of the candidates in the general election. But getting back to this June primary, in addition to this primary race, there will be Democratic and Republican primary races for New York State Governor and Lieutenant Governor. Once again this year, New Yorkers have the option of voting early. Passage of the early voting laws was a victory for the League of Women Voters in the state of New York, and the League of Women Voters advocated for decades for such a law with the goal of increasing the state's poor record of voter participation. So if you like early voting, why not support our local League of Women Voters of Larchmont and Maranek? And when you do, you're also supporting the County League, the State League, and the National Leagues, of which we're a part of all of those, and all of which work to protect and promote the rights of voters to participate in this most fundamental act of democracy. Early voting for this primary will begin on this Saturday, June 18th, and continue through Sunday, June 26th. Registered voters eligible to vote in their party's primary will be able to cast their ballot at any of Westchester County's 23 designated polling locations. And for those who don't vote early, primary day this year will be on Tuesday, June 28th. And on that day, you must vote at your usual assigned polling site from the hours of 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. For locations and of polling places and hours, a list of all the races that will appear on your ballot, information about candidates, and all other election information, please visit our League of Women Voters site, which is vote411.org. That's vote411.org. And all you have to do is enter your address. And you can also find information about polling locations, hours, voting by absentee ballot on the County Board of Elections website, which is citizenparticipation.westchestergov.com. To help keep you informed, these debates are provided by the League of Women Voters of Larchmont Mamaroneck. We're a small group of volunteers, but we accomplish a lot. In addition to candidates' forums, our other activities include sponsoring local high school students to participate in the State League's Students Inside Albany program. We host our annual luncheon. This year, we had our speaker, uh, District Attorney Miriam Roca. We contribute our local information to the Vote 411 Voters Guide that I was just mentioning. We welcome new citizens at Naturalization Court, and we encourage them to vote. We register voters, and we keep people informed on our website, which is lwvlm.org. We also have a Facebook page and our informational email blasts. And we would love for you to become a member, especially an active participant in our local league. And even though our name reflects our roots in the women's suffrage movement, we welcome members and volunteers of all genders, so please join us. We will soon begin our debates. This year, in addition to league-generated questions, members of the public submitted their suggestions for questions for the candidates, and we want to thank those who took the time to send us their questions. We regret we may not be able to ask them all. If you don't hear your question asked, it may be because we combined questions on similar topics or because of time constraints or nonconformance with our nonpartisan policy. Before we begin, I want to thank the candidates for appearing tonight. I want to thank LMC Media for their live broadcast, and I want to thank the town of Mamaroneck for the use of the town center. Thanks also to our league member, Terry Toll, who will be serving as our timekeeper tonight. 
And finally, I want to welcome and thank tonight's moderator, Alice McNamara. Ms. McNamara is a 20-year member of the League of Women Voters of New Rochelle. She's active in voter services, and she's been moderating for eight years. So I am pleased to have her here tonight, and now I will turn the debates over to Ms. McNamara. Thank you, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Large Front and Maranek for inviting me, and a special extra thank you to Terry Toll for uh, being the timekeeper, which is not an easy job. She's an, sort of anonymous here, but uh, I want to thank, thank her. The League of Women Voters owns the forum, and only those permitted by the League may record, and uh, that must air. Uh, and even those must air the forum in its entirety due to FCC regulations that require that a debate must not be edited and must be broadcast in its entirety, either live or reasonably soon after it takes place. The format of tonight's event, each candidate for office is allowed a one and a half minute opening statement and I will then read the questions. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes to respond to each question, and then each candidate is allowed a one and a half minute closing statement. The order of speaking was determined by lot, and the order will rotate throughout uh, the debate. And um, so we will begin first with our opening statements. Um, well, the, the candidates in order are Leilani Yazar-Reed, Richard Littman, Andrew Spatz, Dan Natchez, Lewis Young, and Emmanuel Rawlings. And we'll start the first opening statement, Ms. Yazar-Reed. Good evening. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. Thank you for my running mates, Lou and Manny, for the, and the volunteers for their endless support on this campaign. And thank you, Andrew, Dan, and Richard, for being present and representing this community with us. And Mayor Tom Murphy for his wonderful endorsement. Lastly, I would like to thank the wonderful Village community because without you, there is no community. Here is my why. I truly believe that this community has raised me and my family. I have come from a family that has lived here for seven generations. I graduated from the Mermanic School District and was raised in the Rhineck School District because of my family roots. My investments in this community has ranged from volunteering as a youth at the CAP Center to the Turkey Trot and participating and working at Co-op Camp. As an adult, I have sat on boards like the Arts Council and Washingtonville Housing and to currently serving on the CRC board and the Mermanic School District <coughs> Equity Team. Advocating for equity and accessible resources has been my thing, has been what I've always been about. I believe that this work never stops. I have bared witness to discrimination and have been discriminated on. I have seen many floods, more than I can count. But I have also witnessed love, compassion, and a sense of community here. Mermanic is my home, just like it is yours. I believe that I am qualified to do this job because I believe that I'm qualified because I believe in the whole and not the fraction. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Lippman. Thank you. I'm Richard Littman, endorsed Democratic candidate for the Village of Mermanek trustee. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this debate and LMC Media for broadcasting it. I want to acknowledge and appreciate the opportunity to reach so many of our village residents and solicit their support and their votes. Whether in the military, teaching at college, or working in government, my life has been dedicated to public service. In my 20 years as a Deputy Commissioner of New York City's Department of Social Services, I utilized active public participation to facilitate hundreds of community-based programs, seeking support and consensus, and recognizing community needs and desires. As an assistant to the Bronx Borough President, I was involved in a broad range of tasks, including housing, budget analysis, community organizing, and constituent service. In my work as a member of the Village Planning Board since 2016, 
I've been committed to the environmental sustainability of the village, and after years of public hearings and examination of the application, voted against the Hampshire project due to its negative environmental impact that included putting residents in harm's way of floodwaters. I value the input of residents and pledge to always include their voices in my decisions if I'm elected trustee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spatz. Good evening. Thank you. I would like to first thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this evening's Democratic debate and LMC Media for airing the event. You truly are an essential part of bringing the electoral process to the people of Mamaroneck. I am Andrew Spatz. I am running for trustee here in the village of Mamaroneck. I've dedicated my career as an attorney here in the village, providing a voice to the unheard and seeking common ground in some of the most adversarial circumstances. With this experience, I am prepared to apply these skills to assure our government is transparent, encourages participation by residents, property owners, and businesses alike. We have serious issues that require s solutions, whether it be implementing the Army Corps project, assuring the quality of life for the entire village, or revamping our antiquated code, I will be ready day one to work collectively and put an end to our divisive politics. As founding member of the Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee, I successfully bridged the gap of individuals polarized by emotions and speculation of the ACE project. I've opened our judicial system for those most vulnerable and take pride in seeking economic and environmental longevity in our industrial area. These accomplishments were not politically motivated. Rather, they, it was a desire to make a difference in the community that we are so fortunate to call home. As trustee, I will remain steadfast in my belief of serving community first, assuring a better tomorrow for my two sons and the village of Mamaroneck. Thank you. Mr. Natchez. I want to thank the League for, uh, for hosting this debate and all of your nonpartisan work, as well as M LMC Media for ca carrying this debate. I am Trustee Dan Natchez, an endorsed Democratic candidate, and I'm running for re-election to work with you to continue to improve our village-sized quality of life. As a lifelong resident, I know what's great about Mamarnik and what needs fixing. I want to thank all of our first responders, village employees, and citizen volunteers for their tireless efforts. I am a firm believer in keeping tax increases under the cap. This year, I led the charge to have a true operating budget and stop moving expenses around because transparency and prudent fiscal management can keep our taxes under control without playing budget games. I know how to improve the environment, minimize flooding, increase recreational activities. I have championed the River Gauge Early Warning System, prohibiting clear cutting of trees, as well as broadening the Recycling Scraps Program by over 200%. When re-elected, I will continue to work to keep our vill small village character, not a city. I will encourage reasonable and responsible development while reclaiming neighborhoods and identities and enhancing the environment. I will, with you, protect our quality of life by controlling taxes and maintaining vital community programs and services. I'm running on my honesty. Thank you. Mr. Young. I'd like to thank the League for this opportunity, uh, my running mates, Lalani and Manny, uh, for standing with me and uh, inspiring me, frankly, and uh, our opponents for their participation in this, uh, in this practice of uh, democracy. Uh, my fellow village residents as well I'd like to thank who are watching tonight, many of whom have rallied to our campaign. I was appointed trustee by Mayor Tom Murphy in January. Before that, I spent 43 years as a professional observer a reporter. Over the course of decades, I've seen the gap between what's promised during times of crisis and what is often delivered. I've spent my professional life holding the powerful to account, sometimes prompting change too often, coming up with stories that fall on deaf ears, and now I find myself in a position to actually take direct action. First came to Mamaroneck 30 years ago to cover a flood. And this reporter was told back then, oh, we got a plan. I moved to this area 22 years ago, and they still promised a plan. Uh, this past September, the plan languished and the promise remained unfulfilled, but the flood mitigation failure is only a symptom of what's wrong with the village government. Uh, in the five months I spent on the Board of Trustees, I've noticed some things, and I get it. Change is scary. Inaction is too easy. Policy paralysis. 
has left us at risk. We cannot continue to stagger from emergency to emergency because of a failure of imagination at the top, the Board of Trustees, the bosses. My name is Lou Young, and I'd appreciate your vote as trustee. Thank you, Mr. Rawlings. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Rawlings. I first want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this event, LMC Media for broadcasting, and uh, my running mates, Lou Young and Leandi Iser reed uh, I also want to thank uh, Tom Murphy for his endorsement and for his continued support in this process and all the volunteers helping uh, me run. There are three trustee positions on the ballot. I seek one of them because I think it's time to pass the baton to another generation with fresh ideas who can make decisions to move the village forward. Like many residents, I experienced experience, uh, Hurricane Ida personally. That did not stop me from uh, being at the FEMA Center every day. I may be somebody who speaks softly, but when push comes to shove, I'm there doing the hard work. I'm a third generation village, uh, village of Marinic resident. I went to the Marinic school system, graduating Marinic High School in 2016, and graduated from Iona College in 2020. Uh, professionally, I work full time for the STEM Alliance. I'm their business manager for the organization and for Co-op Camp. Uh, Co-op Camp is our only summer program for low-income residents. This program brings summer learning to approximately 230 campers. Um, I'm asking for your support, to, support and for me and my running mates because there's no more time for inaction. We need to curtail flooding, make our streets safer, and continue the diversity of our beloved village. Thank you. Thank you. The first question will go first to Mr. Lippman, and we'll proceed from there. <clears throat> the village is waiting for the Army Corps of Engineers flood mitigation project to be funded. We know this project will not fully eradicate flooding in the village. What specific steps do you suggest in addition to this project to mitigate flooding in the village? It's a good question. Uh, tell you the truth, it was obvious from the night of the hearing at the Emlyn Theater that uh, the Army Corps project alone is not going to resolve the issue. And what we need to do is take a regional approach. Uh, Mamaroneck is not the source of the flooding, we're the recipient of the flooding. Uh, it starts upstream, water flows downstream, and we get the, the damage, if, so to speak. Um, I'd like to see more involvement on the part of the county, uh, on the part of the state, and in conjunction with the Corps of Engineers, if you marshal enough resources, we can correct all these, I don't want to call them mistakes, but we can correct the, the attempts that haven't succeeded in the past and take an overall regional view and resolve the issue. Mr. Spatz. Thank you for this question, and this is dear to my heart. Um, since 2007, as I made reference to, I'm one of the founding members of the Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee, and we have taken every effort that we could to address these issues on a local basis and also working with our federal and state county partners. First and foremost, there is no civil bullet. The Army Corps project is absolutely part of the issue and part of the solution. I testified in Washington on behalf of the village in 2017 to bring home good policy that would be effectuated. In addition to the Army Corps project, we need to hold our neighbors accountable. We need to sit down with our neighboring communities so that the runoff that is being caused and brought down to our community can either cease or at least in the future we can effectuate change. We, as a community, there are low-hanging fruits that we can start today. Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee has worked tirelessly. We worked in conjunction with the municipality to obtain a vac truck. We didn't have a vac truck which utilizes the ability to clean out storm drains in advance of storms. The, mat the issue is what can we do 72 hours, 48 and 24 hours out ahead of the storm to better prepare ourselves, whether it's maintenance, maintaining our infrastructure, and actually hitting areas that are frequently flooded. There is no simple solution, but with a collective effort, we can make a difference. Okay, thank you. Mr. Young? Oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Natchez. No problem. Thank you. Uh, just to correct the opening statement, um, the Army Corps of Engineers project has been funded, and that funding cannot be withdrawn. 
uh, except by an act of Congress. Uh, but we, there, it, like my colleagues have said, it is not a silver bullet, and it is not going to stop flooding. Uh, and it is a big issue because the, the core project can be improved without delaying and without sacrificing any of the, uh, the approvals that have been received to date. So we need to do that. We need to work with them to tweak the project to make it better. Um, we also need to continue to uh, clean our rivers. Um, but, uh, I've championed uh, the, getting the early warning system of the river gauges, uh, which will let people know what will happening, opening up the village parking lots uh, so people can move their cars uh, when they know that there's going to be a flood. Thank you. Now, Mr. Young. I the uh, era of inaction on this issue is over. Uh, let's start with the rivers. <clears throat> When it floods at the confluence of the rivers, we need to get the water out of there quickly. That the Army Corps project is part of that. We have a, a responsibility there as well. Um, that is why uh, I spearheaded and got passed a $1.36 million effort this year to uh, undo a decade of uh, neglect in the rivers, which were uh, clogged with silt, remained clogged with silt and, and debris, and we need to clear that up, and we are doing that now with our money. We need to take responsibility for what we have to do and not just wait for someone else to do it for us. Uh, then we need to slow the approach of the water uh, with upstream retention. We need to take a good, hard look at that dam that's uh, uh, up by the waterworks, uh, and we need to uh, use it and improve it if we can determine that it helps downstream flooding. If it does, then we need to jump in and take that, uh, by the, that bull by the horns. Possibly reestablish the Maranac uh, Reservoir with the help from the county, upgrade the neglected get dam, as I mentioned, utilize the river gauges that uh, my colleague mentioned a, a minute ago to uh, regulate that dam if necessary, and also go upstream and talk to our communities, uh, uh, to uh, Harrison, to White Plains, to uh, the, the town of Mamaroneck, to the county, because what they do upstream contributes to the flooding, absolutely. It all needs to be done yesterday. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rawlings? Could you repeat the question for me, please? Certainly. The village is waiting for the Army Corps of Engineers flood mitigation project to be funded. We know this project will not fully eradicate flooding in the village. What specific steps do you suggest in addition to this project to mitigate flooding in the village? Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, first, I just want to thank our Deputy Mayor Lou Young for securing that $1.36 million to uh, begin to help have our rivers dredged and clear of debris. That's something that hasn't been done for eight years. This is a line that's been in the budget, it's been there, it's been unfunded, and we've seen from the most recent flood how drastic it is if we don't do things to mitigate flooding. That's one step into you know, helping mitigate flooding. The Army Corps Engineers Plan is an excellent plan. Like you said, that's not gonna start tomorrow. We need, we need to look at our you know, local municipalities that are in our surrounding area, like White Plains and Rye and Harrison, to work with them to create a multi-pronged approach to help mitigate flooding. We also need to prepare our staff. We have an excellent staff, but they don't have the right support right now from the board to kind of push forward and you know prepare for flooding in the future. During those days after the Hurricane Ida, I was there leading their FEMA center as a volunteer. They need to be prepared for these situations. We need an emergency response team that works with uh, us during these flooding situations to be best prepared for flooding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe that what everybody else says, since I am the last person to answer this question, is spot on. We do need to work with everybody. The Army Corps Engineers is a plan, but it is not the end all be all. We have a flood mitigation committee. We need to really work with them, be transparent with them, listen to their ideas because we all may be experts or we all try to be experts, but if we work together, because that's the purpose, working together to ensure that our communities are no longer receiving or being recipients of the amount of trauma that they have received thus far with all the floods that we've had. Um, I believe working with our local governments, our other governments, is it would be beneficial thinking about upstream and how it comes down, also thinking about our roadways, concrete and how we build, Con 
water does not go through concrete. So we have to look at multiple approaches, speaking with our engineers, speaking with um, those who are experts or who've been working in housing developments to ensure that people are not being flooded as they have been in the past. So. Thank you. That is it. Um, the next question will go first to Mr. Spatz. What makes you the best candidate to represent the Democratic Party in the village of Mamaroneck? That's a good question. <laughs> I have to turn back to my opening. Um, I fortunately have dedicated my career to providing a voice to those that otherwise wouldn't be heard and seeking common ground in the most adversarial circumstances. And we are in challenging times, whether it be COVID, our economy, just politics by definition in our generation. I believe that I would be able to provide that bridge to bring people together, to bring this party we're sitting here tonight back together to bring this community together. 2017 was a perfect example with the Flood Mitigation Advisor Committee with the original Army Corps project. Our community was divided tremendously, but through patience, through finding common ground, alleviating uh, misnomers or perceptions of what a project could be, we were able to eliminate that and actually come and bring it to Mamaroneck. I want to bring those very skills here so that we can have a better tomorrow, not just for us, but for our kids in the future. Mr. Natchez. Without being immodest, um, I've served on the board for three years. I know how, how government runs. Unfortunately, government takes, you know, uh, time to do things, you know, we measure things in, uh, quickly, but uh, unfortunately we have to look at it in terms of millenniums in trying to get things done, and that's unfortunate. But I do know what to, how to get things done, and I have proven that over the last three years. I've been in this village all my life. I have worked very hard. Uh, the, one of the biggest issues we have is maintaining our budget and living by our budget no differently than we run our households and our businesses. And we need to do that. Uh, and we need to stop playing games with the budget. In addition to that, the other big qualities of life issues are very important to be worked on. Uh, we have exciting traffic. The schools are, uh, you know, overcrowded. We need to, we have stopped, we've tried to stop overdevelopment. We need to do more of it uh, in, in terms of real planning, uh, not only to keep people out of the flood zone and uh, putting people at risk, whether it be residents or first responders, but it has to do with trying to bring things together and listening to the people and bringing everybody together and working together to solve these problems. And that, that is the key to it. And that is what I've been doing uh, for the last three years that I've been on the board. Thank you, Mr. Young. I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I chafe at the pattern I see sometimes in local government of low turnout elections, closed committees, and an aversion to contested elections. Uh, this primary is only occurring because our ticket forced the issue. Uh, the committee, a committee wanted to appoint the nominees, and uh, that was that. And uh, we think the Democratic voters of this village should have the opportunity face it, this may be the only uh, real election that we have in this, if, uh, given the current state of the local uh, Republican Party. So this is the forum that we uh, use to um, um, in energize democracy. And uh, it's not in secret meetings, and it's not in, in deals behind uh, closed doors, and it's not in, um, in doing favors for friends and um, and lawsuits, quixotic lawsuits, and all of the other things that have happened uh, in this uh, local government uh, that uh, simply uh, doesn't uh, relate to most people here. Um, I represent a form of government that will represent everyone in Mamaroneck, 20,000 people, not just a few people who live near each other in one part of town. And, uh, and that is what's uh, at stake in this election. Um, we have to think uh, in a global sense, plan ahead, and be, 
be mindful that, uh, that n not everyone has as much um, benefit of a uh, benefit of, uh, of uh, affluence as uh, as all of us. Thank you, Mr. Rawlings. Could you, could you repeat the question? Thank sure. you. Sure. What makes you the best candidate to represent the Democratic Party in the village of Mamaroneck? Thank you. Uh, I think what makes me the best candidate is I'm a, I'm a new face. I'm a, I'm a fresh face, and I want to bring new ideas to the village. For too long, it's been the same people running our village, and we've, there's been too much inaction. I, I believe it's time for us to change, and if we keep putting the same people up every year through these small little committees, we're never going to see that change. We're never going to get any progress. It's time to bring our community together. I want to bring, you know, I want to bring our community together. I come from a part of Mamaroneck that has been underrepresented for far too long. I think it's time that we have a new voice to kind of lead our, our village and push our village forward. I want our village to be accessible to everyone. Although we have a large population that comes from Spanish-speaking households, this is, you know, that is not, you know, in the village, they're, they don't have access to everything. I go back, I'm gonna go back to Hurricane Ida. I helped to assist and lead the FEMA center there. When I went out and went there, it was a chaotic situation. There were no translators. A large part of the people who were flooded, out, flooded in the Washington area are Spanish speaking people. How could we, how could we potentially, how could we possibly serve all our residents and not even have translators there in such a traumatic situation? I want to bring more accessible, more access to our village and a new voice and new ideas. That's why I think I'm the best candidate to serve the village of America. So why am I the best candidate for the village of Mermeranek? Um Because I represent diversity. Because I am a woman. I am a African-American, Afro-Latina woman. And we are, as Manny said, underrepresented. When I ask the question, do you, sp do you go to certain communities? When I've asked the question even prior to me wanting to run for Village of Mamaroneck, people can't answer that question. So why not me? I can represent myself and I can represent the whole entire community because I've been here and I've lived here long for a long time. My family has lived here for a long time. I understand the history of Mermeranek. I also bring mediation skills. I've been working as a mediator for over 20 years. I've been working as a community advocate for over 20 years and that can be shown in what I do and I do and I am able to still do with or without. So you would want to, you do want people who can represent the entire community because that is what it's all about. The entire village of Mermeranek, not just one section, but the entire village of Mermeranek. That's it. Okay, thank you. My turn. It's very hard not to sound immodest, but uh, I think the criteria for serving the public really most important is experience. And I, I spent 21 years in New York City Department of Social Services as deputy commissioner, five and a half years as assistant to the Bronx borough president. Uh, while I was working for the city, they sent us to contract school, so I know how to analyze budgets and how to make contracts that get the money's worth for the municipality. Uh, went through an executive development program. Um, and since 1975, I've been teaching urban studies and state and local government at uh, three different colleges. Um, the pandemic sort of, uh, put a quash on the adjunct market, so to speak, but I learned a lot over all those years. Um, today is an interesting day. It marks exactly to the day, 11 years, that I moved to Mamaroneck from New York, from Manhattan. Why did I move? I got priced out of Manhattan. I got displaced, I got gentrified, and I, I came to Mamaroneck and I'm just so happy to be here, and just like I did in New York, I want to give back and help our community. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question will go first to Mr. Natchez. 
Other than flood mitigation, what are your top priorities for the village? My top priorities for the village are continuing to get the budget under control, working on uh, all the different issues that the neighborhoods are having, uh, the quality of life issues. Um, but, you know, the, when my colleagues say that we haven't done anything, we've been doing a lot. Um, and uh, it takes time to get it done. Um, but our biggest priorities uh, and monetarily are for infrastructure. Um, you know, we've committed, uh, you know, well over $5 million to $10 million uh, on our sewer projects. Um, the Budget Committee has come up with guidelines to, uh, for the board to adopt uh, on uh, how we uh, do both uh, purchasing, operating budgets, and capital budgets. And as I said before, this is the first year that we have not played games on the um, uh, operating budget uh, to stay under the cap. Uh, and, it, and if my colleagues agree, it will be the first year in decades that we will have an approved capital budget, which guides us in our blueprint of how we do things and what the important things are. And we have lots to do in both in terms of infrastructure and quality of life issues uh, and uh, overhauling our uh, zoning code uh, to make it more usable, more user-friendly, and uh, prevent overcrowding in uh, housing and um, uh, floodplain areas. Thank you. Mr. Young? Yes. Um, the, the question again was uh, additional priorities are beyond flood. But other than flood mitigation, what Pedestrian are safety, bike and sidewalk network uh, th that makes sense, that is coordinated. Uh, a solar power generation. We are in uh, a desperate, uh, facing desperate times when it comes to electric generation, and we have the ability to generate some of our own electricity and uh, and sell it and and end talk about opening a uh, alternate revenue streams and keep property taxes down. That's a great way to keep property taxes under control. Uh, power, policy paralysis uh, um, in this um, uh, focus on just uh, uh, budget lines has squandered a decade of low interest rates that have now come to an end. That window passed. We, we had a magic opportunity to do many things, and the Board of Trustees sat on its hands, all right? And uh, it's unforgivable. Inaction is not something that can get us uh, forward. Uh, the comprehensive plan, uh, zoning, the rest of that, it's been finished since 2019, and it sits. There was an um, opportunity to talk about it uh, even this week. That opportunity passed because uh, the board was distracted by some other, uh, other matters. And um, it's just not focused on the future of this village, and that's what we need to do. We need to do the business of the entire village and not the uh, pet projects of just a few. Mr. Wallings. Thank you. Um, Besides flooding, I believe, you know, affordability. Um, we don't have sufficient affordable housing in this village. You know, this became really apparent for me and I'm sure for a lot of people when after Hurricane Ida, a lot of our residents were out of their homes and were <coughs> displaced. Think of all the children who had to, you know, start moving, start the school year living somewhere else, or all the families who weren't close to their jobs. This is not okay. We need accessible, affordable housing. And this is not just for people who are, you know, low income. This is for people of all ages, our seniors who, you know, are want to downsize and still remain in the village because they like the amenities and the quality of life. Our young adults who are like myself, who continue to graduate high, uh, college and want to stay in the village or the town, their hometown. Um, another priority of mine is, you know, pedestrian safety. Our people, our residents should be able to walk anywhere in a village on a sidewalk. We need, we need more accessible sidewalks. We need bike paths for our, you know, our residents who like to ride bikes. This will help, you know, help with traffic congestion. More people will be riding bikes. I also believe that, you know, we need to come up with, with more programming for our seniors. Our seniors are a big part of our community, community, and I think we need to, you know, they need to be somebody who are, is represented as well as people our younger generation. Thank you. I think that we obviously do need to handle our flooding in our community. That is definitely important to me. Um, but I believe that as well as building a more sustainable and accessible community, 
where we have people from all, who speak all different languages have access to our information. Our infrastructure is steady, creating opportunities to develop accessible and affordable housing, not just in flood zones, as colleague, my colleagues have said, but also being mindful of our schools and where they're overpopulated. Um, I also would like to support developing housing in areas that is not going to possibly create current day red lighting policies. We want to stray away from that. Um, and I also want to be, make sure that we are creating better and honest communication amongst us all and the, and the public. So that is my answer. Yes. Okay, thank you. My biggest priority is paying attention to how the municipality budgets and how it taxes. Um, I don't have to t tell you about inflation. It's, it's really problematic these days. Um, part of the job of government is to be responsible. Uh, we're taking taxation, tax money from the residents and they deserve an efficient and effective utilization of those resources. Um, I'll give you an example. I remember in 1973, New York City almost went bankrupt. I know it cost me a week's salary uh, to contribute um, because they were misusing the capital budget as a piggy bank. When you borrow money for the capital budget, it's paid for by bonding, you pay interest on the bonds. And that interest is paid for out of your everyday operating budget. So careful attention to budgeting and taxation has got to be the biggest priority. Second priority, almost as important, is it's time to update the zoning code, uh, not only to prevent overdevelopment, but to be sensitive to the environmental impact of growth and the interrelationship between schools and the environment and traffic and, and housing and affordability, it's all linked together. Thank you. I wish I had 20 minutes to answer this question, but uh, to start with our antiquated code. Um, we have a harmony of residential and businesses here in this community, and our code needs to be updated. If you're a business, perfect example, and this isn't just from what I've heard or what I've seen, direct experience of uh, re representing applicants before the various land use boards and committees, we need to have more of an efficient process. Um, I'm going to turn to the Industrial Advisor Committee in 2014, which we started to assure long-term economic and environmental longevity in the industrial area. We were progressive, we brought together various land use boards and committees so that we can come together to effectuate what would be ideal for this area. Businesses are a vibrant part of our community. And by doing this, we were able to arrive at a draft of an overlay which would achieve just that. In addition to revisiting our antiquated code, which hurts both homeowners and businesses, we need to address the quality of life, whether it involves going and it, to parks in Washingtonville safely, whether it involves, and I agree with my colleagues here, roads and sidewalks, whether in Orienta, Shrakers, or Washingtonville, our children, our guests, our families deserve sidewalks. Stop the revolving door of personnel here in our village. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question um, will be first to Mr. Young. What are your priorities for infrastructure improvement? Yeah, village, the old village hall uh, was neglected and deteriorated and uh, mm -hmm. is being uh, worked on now under an emergency order because frankly the board of trustees didn't uh, give proper direction early on. Uh, we need to uh, address that. We need to figure out uh, how to uh, give our police department a decent place to work. Our police department is a disgrace. 
that, uh, that, that facility would be an embarrassment in Appalachia, not as, as, and is really a disgrace in, in, a, in an affluent community. And, and the fact that it, it was allowed to get to that, that point is uh, a reflection on the, uh, the inactivity from the Board of Trustees on this matter uh, going years and years back. So that's a priority. The dam is a priority. We have to get a, f a fix on uh, what it does and can we um, uh, use it to uh, regulate the uh, upstream uh, flow of water uh, and, and perhaps the retention. It's part of the flood, uh, the flood uh, 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 mitigation policy. Uh, also, I would like to see, and this is my, my personal project and we've exploring it, I'd like to see a solar array uh, placed on the uh, capped Taylor Land, Taylor Lane uh, landfill. Um, th that would have to be discussed with residents and, uh, and, and various other uh, boards, but uh, it is uh, the DEC's preferred use for a capped landfill, and it can generate a kilowatt of electricity and save us a lot of money. Could you repeat the question, please? Thank you. Sure. What are your priorities for infrastructure improvement? Um, first, and foremost, I think we need to give our police officers who work in our village hall a safer place to be. That building has not been renovated or updated in any way for far too long. If you go in there, it's not safe. We have our police cars outside that could be accessed at any time. That's something that's not okay. God forbid somebody comes in and destroys all of them. How are they going to be able to respond to an emergency? So first and foremost, I think we need to take care of our officers and our village hall. Um, another part of our infrastructure is to expand and, you know, update certain pieces so the village is more accessible for all. For example, our website, it's not accessible to all residents. It's not in Spanish. It's not able to be accessed, for everybody, accessed to everybody, and it's a little confusing. Our residents should know at any point, be able to know at any point they can go to our website and get the information that they need. Right now, that is not the case. Um, another thing, uh, another infrastructure thing we need to work on and infrastructure it's not only about you know physical things I think it's infrastructure within how the board operates and how we communicate with our staff right now you know there are right now our staff doesn't feel like they're supported they need to know and if I'm when I'm elected trustee that they will have my full support and they would you know we would be able to set those priorities going forward thank you I definitely like to um, concur with um, what M Manny and Lou was saying about our infrastructure in terms of our police department. It does need a bit of an update. Um, we do also need to work on widening our sidewalks. The other day, as I am driving by, I'm seeing a woman roll an elderly lady in a wheelchair and the elderly lady tipped over into the grass that is not that our inf that's part of our infrastructure and we do need make to, we do need to make sure or ensure that everyone has access to use our public sidewalks to be able to just simply walk and if they are unable to we need to handle that um i also agree with manny when it comes down to our inside, handling our village in terms of not handling, but working with our village employees. There is a lot of miscommunication. This is one of the main reasons why I have decided to run is because there is dysfunction and because there is a lot of disarray and disagreements. And by bringing in a person like myself who can mediate or who can be able to respect each other or respect our village manager, respect our village employees, I think that can bring a more harmonious um, government and we will be able to get things done rather than having things not be done with the inaction. The principal job of, of a trustee is to make intelligent and, and efficient policy for the village and not, not interfere with the operations on the management of, of the village. But unfortunately, what, what cries out now for the most attention is, is the whole set of issues connected to flooding. Um, 
It's going to require an approach that's bigger than the village. Uh, we're really going to need help from, from the core of engineers, from the county, from the state, from anybody else who can uh, put a few bucks in um, to deal with flooding on a long-term basis. Um, just imagine how a homeowner feels every four years, their house floods. And it's just the same problem over and over again. So we need to look for intelligent infrastructure solutions, like, for example, improving the sewers. Uh, there, there are sewers that are probably 100 years old that haven't been inspected and could, could certainly use some help. Um, it's nice to keep up the parks. Uh, you need fresh air and open space. And God knows the village hall um, on uh, Mount Pleasant and Prospect certainly needs some work. Uh, it is an embarrassment. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to touch on some of the issues that uh, my colleagues have already uh, made reference to. First and foremost, our storm drains, the infrastructure. I personally uh, was very involved in our ability to get a vac truck that would start maintaining and cleaning out these pivotal components will help, which will help alleviate flooding. Replacement of our infrastructure is imperative it costs a lot of money. In advance of being able to bond or to what, are, what we have to do to achieve this, there are low hanging fruits that we can start today. Um, with regards to partnership with the private sector, if there is going to be any type of development in the community, to partner up with the private sector to help share the expenses of enhancing and improving our infrastructure. Recreation, such a good point. I would ask for a summit with the individuals that run the rec, uh, soccer, sports. There are issues where there is a feeling that there's not enough space for our kids to utilize um, our parks. Um, I would agree with everyone the police department deserve better. Our first responders put their lives online for us, their facility, we need to do better. Um, our building department, that's the first contact we usually have and we need to assure a seamless process Thank to you. support them. Thank you, Mr. Natchez. The village has over $130 million of infrastructure projects that have to be undertaken, most of which are, uh, the bulk of which are mandated um, over the next five years. Um, we also, so we need to make sure that we undertake these projects in a way that doesn't price everybody out of this village. Um, you know, we, with affordable housing, uh, we changed our code to try and um, uh, to help uh, create more affordable housing. Um, but I lost the battle because it's only aimed basically at the 80% um, AMI level as opposed to what's really needed at the 40% level. Um, so the issue ba basically becomes priorities. And that's one of the reasons that I am pushing so hard to get a capital budget approved so that we follow that. We've been, you know, we've had the uh, police department and the uh, village hall uh, requ requested to have uh, architectural plans uh, to be under undertaking uh, its revision and remodeling, um, and we're still waiting for them. Uh, now, COVID plays a part of that, but it also has to do with the priorities because government seems to be more reactive, and I believe in more planning and proactive. And that's how we have to handle it for the future. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question will go first to Mr. Rawlings. What ideas do you have for keeping the budget under control? Thank you. Um, first, I think we need to start looking at how our tax dollars are spent. I think that's really important that we look at that. Um, something that we do now, we do a lot of in-house work. I am a member of the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission or committee, and every every time we meet, I'm, we're always told how we're saving money on our budget because a lot of the projects we do with upgrading a park or you know putting new plants in or fixing up our docks, it's always done in-house. We're not going out to other resources to come in and 
access and upgrade and fix things up for us throughout our village. So we save a lot of money doing things in-house. <clears throat> You know, there's, there are certain things our village has to pay for, and I understand that. You know, we have an excellent Department of Public Works, Parks Department, and Emergency Services. You know, they, they are an ex they are all excellent teams. All our staff has, are excellent. And to go back to doing things in-house, think about when the flood happened. They worked 14-hour days to give our village the best flood recovery in our history. I witnessed, I witnessed this firsthand from losing my home for over a month and a half and seeing them on those streets, cleaning up and bringing and taking things out of people's homes. After the flood, the sanitation team helped pick up over three months of trash in two days. You know, we save a lot of, we save a lot of money doing things in-house and I think that's how we can do that in the future. Thank you. Can you repeat the question? Certainly. Thank you. What ideas do you have for keeping the budget under control? In agreement with what Manny was saying in regards to keeping things in-house, but also creating other streams of revenue, um, we can, we have beautiful parks throughout the village of Mermerick that we could utilize to build pavilions and hopefully in the near future create spaces where people can rent out these spaces to build more, um, to build up our revenue. We also, I personally would like to, well, no, let me say this. <laughs> I also believe that in order for us to keep our budget down, stop taxing our community, and not giving them enough in return, we can use the pavilions, we can build community centers, we can really take a look at what is important and follow through with what actually needs to be done, as well as look at to our other, um, my apologies, as well as look at to other municipalities like the town, um, the town board, and use shared resources. I know most recently they um, purchased a brine truck. We can also, and also using our senior centers, that's another way to keep our budget down and share our resources so that our seniors, our youth, our community are able to use these resources to keep our budget down. Okay, thank you. Um, I've done a good bit of um, budget analysis in, in my professional career and yeah, it really is important to control spending. And, you know, it's, it's too simplistic to say do everything in-house. Sometimes it's cheaper to contract out because when you do stuff in-house, not only do you have personnel costs, but you have pension and sick leave and health care benefits, and it could end up being more expensive than contra contracting out for the same service. Um, so you have to do an analysis. There, there's no one best way. You have to look for the most efficient way to, to do it. Um, and the, the other point I wanted to make, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier, um, it's very, very important not to abuse the budget. If you shove everything hidden into the capital budget, you got to bond to pay for, you know, to, to create the funds for the capital budget, and you gotta pay interest on it. And the interest is part of your operating budget. So you end up increasing your budgetary obligations, it doesn't really help you, and it's not terribly efficient. So good budget management is critical, and that, that's probably one of the most important tasks that would face a trustee. Thank you. Competitive pricing, mindful, efficient use of bonds, avoid unnecessary spending on interest, avoid borrowing more than we're able to pay back. Um, there's references to the fact that there was a bump during COVID of sales tax. Well, anybody in suburbia experienced that. And my fear is that when the bump starts to alleviate and interest rates as they are now start going up, we're gonna have a problem. And we need to be aware of that because suburbia did really well during COVID with homes being purchased and obviously um, just uh, individuals that were fearful to return back to the city. I love 
partnering up with municipality, private and public working together. Again, it's worked very well in Port Chester and in Harrison, whether that has to do with partnering up with improving the infrastructure, the sewers, or sharing parking lots in the evening, allowing private businesses to utilize uh, public uh, parking uh, to address the parking issues. Parks and recreation, excuse me, parks and recreation. I would love to see the private sector, uh, many, many families are willing to contribute to the village to enhance the baseball fields and soccer fields that are used every day of the week. So I, th ooh, time to go, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The issue of the budget are really boils down to priorities and cost benefit. Uh, and one of the things that I have d done is worked with the budget committee in developing guidelines for not only bidding uh, uh, and competitive bidding, um, but priorities, how, what to do uh, for your adopting of the operating budget and the capital budget. Unfortunately, the board has not adopted these yet. I'm hoping that they will this year. Uh, it is important. Um, we've sent back uh, different proposals for different infrastructure projects for uh, where competitive bidding was not uh, required for uh, engineering services. Uh, the last one that was done, I sent back, uh, came back for, with a savings of $96,000 with the same scope of work and the same issues being undertaken. So taking things in-house can work at times, but you need to have the financial analysis to it. And one of the things we do is we don't do enough financial analysis. So when, we, when the board is faced with making decisions both on priorities and how to proceed, we don't have that information that we should have. And that's, that's, that is what we need to focus on. Uh, and that will help dramatically in moving forward. As I said, we have $130 million in you know, capital expenditures that we have to do um, you know, over the next five years. And just saying it doesn't come into particular budgets doesn't solve the problem. Mr. Young. A budget isn't just numbers on a paper, it's execution. Um, and uh, efficiency is the key. I'll give you an example. A few years back when he started on a job, our village manager found pockets of um, uh, overtime abuse that was uh, funneling tax dollars out of the budget at an unsupervised and routine uh, basis. Uh, he fixed it. Uh, yeah, he fixed it with his... Uh, <laughs> with his uh, um, with his style and uh, got considerable pushback. But um, now we're paying overtime again, but we're getting something for it. And that's the, that's the issue. It's not just the amount of money you're paying out, but are you getting something for it? People are making overtime now, but they're in the rivers dredging and cleaning them, not dredging, the, the, our guys are, are, are cleaning, uh, pulling uh, the debris and stuff out. So uh, that's something that we bought with the tax money. It's something that, that the uh, taxpayers paid for, that they can see that they're getting, and not just money that just kind of wanders off. Um, we can uh, generate alternative revenue sources, as I mentioned. Uh, EV charging stations are uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the pipeline, and they will provide some, um, some revenue. Uh, municipal power generation, I mentioned that also. We can make electricity and sell it. Um, Harbor Island fees, the Harbor Island we can um, create uh, pavilions there that we can rent out for uh, for parties and for um, people who want to use it and that can make money okay, thank you and the next question will go first to Ms. Yaza Reed how would you ensure that the voices of minority groups are heard in the village of Mamaroneck hi it to me, it, it's a it's an easy question because that's what I'm considered <laughs> is a minority, and I'm always amplifying the voices of all people, especially those who are underserved. I'm not really um, fond of the word minority, um, but I would say the underserved communities, which can be considered those um, who are uh, people of color. Um, but also that's not just people of color, that also can be 
those on a lower income uh, level um, or on a, on a different side of the track, um, those, we, those could be people who, what we consider those who are not served. So I, like I said before, I spent over 20 years advocating as something that I do very well, advocating and finding solutions. I am on the Mamaroneck School District's district equity team, constantly fighting for our youth and their voices, constantly fighting for um, the teachers and the staff to ensure that there is equity and diversity. I believe that the board should be educated on um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, trainings. That's something that should be had, because if you can't do that, then you can't represent your community, and that is important. Thank you. Mr. Lippman. Okay, thank you. I think it's uh, really critical, uh, especially in this day and age, for everybody's voice to be heard. In my professional career in government, um, made no difference whether I was proposing projects or, or uh, trying to get support for projects in, uh, in Harlem or in East New York or in the South Bronx. Um, I had experience in dealing with people across the broad spectrum. And, you know, it's not, it's not so different from the people I met when I was in the Army. Uh, spent some time in Vietnam many years ago. And one thing you learn is that people are people, and the needs are common, and the needs should be tended to. Um, I think my success in all those years in New York City government was, was due to my philosophy of community participation, involvement in the decision making, not to impose stuff on neighborhoods, but to work with neighborhoods to produce meaningful projects that benefit the quality of life. Thank you. Lani, um, I have to say that uh, your efforts are absolutely um, imperative. Efforts like that to encourage the dialogue, not just with parents, but also with our schools and children. Um, I think that community meetings, the smaller community meetings that we've been having and should have more of, more frequency, most individuals don't like speaking in public, no less in large audiences. But having the more grassroots, localized meetings, whether it be with our local authorities, um, serving as an attorney here in the village of Amerinic, there have been many a times I've literally woke, I've walked people over to report situations because they feared that they would be prosecuted for one reason or another. Um, we have to work on our outreach. It's absolutely imperative. And as someone who has dedicated himself to giving a voice to those that otherwise wouldn't be heard, there's something to be um, learned and taught. And this is a dialogue that just can't disappear tonight because we're at a debate. This is something that has to be followed by actions, working collectively, working together, um, and it's something that has to be done. And um, it shouldn't be a red herring or just something that's brought up during an elect electoral cycle. Thank you. Mr. Natchez. For the past three years, I've had an open door policy. Uh, so people who are concerned about anything can call and I will talk with them. Uh, and I will meet with them. And I have been regularly doing that throughout the entire village. Um, I walk the entire village. Um, I've been here most of my life. Uh, I was raised here. Uh, you know, it, the village has a great deal to offer. Um, and I encourage the dialogue. And I encourage trying to understand not only what the issue is, but a bringing people together in a meaningful way to solve problems, to solve concerns. Um, there, are, it doesn't have to. It's not a race issue. It is. Uh, it is a issue of people in different groups, from different backgrounds, and different ideas, and different desires. And bringing them together and talking things out is exceedingly important. 
uh, and it's been very meaningful throughout uh, throughout my three years on the board. Uh, has resulted in numerous projects being undertaken, you know, to solve problems, uh, both in terms of expenditures, but also in terms of how we act and what we do. Mr. Young. You increase the voices of the underserved by listening, recruiting, involving and engaging them. Uh, our campaign is an example of that. I met my two running mates because we're neighbors and we met after the flood. That's simple. Um, I want to uh, bring people of color into the government. I mean, when I arrived, it seemed a little monochromatic to me. I mean, uh, I, I just had to react that way. I was a little surprised at how, how little diversity there was. There's some. Um, I want geographic diversity because uh, we, we, we live in different parts of town. I want geographic diversity on all of our uh, volunteer boards, especially, especially the land use boards. Um, the people should be from all parts of the village. Um, I moved to Mamaroneck, uh, going on four years now, and I uh, fell uh, in love with the um, ethnic texture and energy in the village, especially the part where I live. Uh, but it's fading as you speak. You can, you can see it fading uh, with gentrification and, and, and with change, and it will vanish if we don't apply ourselves. And uh, that's, what's, uh, uh, that's what's at stake. Uh, that's what's at stake in this election and, uh, and at this time of our lives. Mr. Rawlings. This is exactly why I'm running. You know, I come from a part of the community that's been underrepresented for far too long. The part of the community I come from has, you know, a large minority, has a lot of minorities in, in that part. You know, how do we re-engage these? We need to realize we need to re-engage these people in the community. You know, that could be through community forums, like Lou said, our, our, all our volunteer boards. We should have a minimum that, you know, everybody, everybody in the community need, we need all parts of the community to be a part of those boards. We cannot only continue to have land use boards and other parts of our boards where it's just pockets of, you know, certain parts of the community that serve on those boards and can only speak for their experiences and what they, they know and want to bring to the village. We have, we have to re-engage these people. People of color in, in the village of the Maronick and the, these minority groups, they need to see people like them in positions of power. How are we going to re-engage? How are we going to make, give them the confidence they need to want to go out and serve our community if every board is, you know, frankly to say, a white older male? They're, they're not going to want to go and feel comfortable to want to serve our community if that's all that they see. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question will go uh, first to Mr. Lippman. What will you do to enforce the ban on the use of leaf blowers during the summer months, which is often ignored by local landscapers, homeowners, and at times the village of Mamaroneck? It's a great question, because uh, a lot of mornings I'm awakened by the leaf blowers from the people across the street. Uh, it's very frustrating. Um, there are or it is, because I'm not sure how many people, but there, there is a code enforcement staff in the village, and they should be enforcing the ban on leaf flowers. Um, I, I think, I know periodically there are, you know, bulletins about it, but I, I'd like to see more in the way of enforcement and um, maybe a bit of an education program to uh, convince homeowners to talk to their landscapers or, or if they do the work themselves, to be considerate of your neighbors. And that, that's really the critical point. It's, it's not so much the fixing or the beauty of the lawn, it's the uh, respect you have for your neighbors. Mr. Spence. Could you please repeat that question? What will you do to enforce the ban on the use of leaf blowers during the summer months, which is often ignored by local landscapers, homeowners, and at times the village of Mamaroneck? Other than going out there and writing a ticket myself, um, no. <laughs> I, I think that public information 
education and changing habit is pivotal. We've had this problem in the past on Old Post Road with snow. Our kids, unfortunately, don't have their own sidewalk going to Central from Orienta to, uh, because of, of the sidewalk, it's just a yellow line. And with information and, re and the assistance of the village, um, behavior changes with reinforcement. Now, talking about our uh, code enforcement, we need to provide more support to our building department and code enforcement officers. That's usually the very first contact people have, whether or not they're homeowners or individuals coming into the community, that's the first spot. So the information, the education component of it before actually enforcement. I think that goes quite a distance. Um, on that note, with the enhanced uh, ability to manage our building department, we could also enhance the ability for affordable housing, looking at the inventory that we currently have to avoid issues like in the city after uh, Ida where people drowned in basements. Provide additional resources, provide additional assistance to one of the most important departments in our community. Okay, thank you. Mr. Natchez. In the past, if you called the police department, they would say it's the building department who has to um, enforce it. I've talked with the chief and the policy now is the police will enforce it as will the uh, building department. Um, what we need is a partnership. When pe people are afraid to call for whatever the reason, uh, they need to call you know, and it, it will be taken care of. More importantly, I try and help in my class that goes out weekly to over 3,000 people. It's in there that you know uh, leaf blowers are not permitted in, uh, during the summer. Uh, but more importantly, I lost the battle with the village uh, board, board uh, because the village, the village itself exempted it. And we need to lead by example, not by exception. And that's part of the problem. Uh, we, you know, one of the things that make this village great is its diversity of the, with the number of people we have from all different backgrounds in numerous countries. Um, and it, talking to them and explaining to them that the police are our friends you know, and they, they need to be, help us to try and solve the problems and uh, not work against it and not just be afraid. So one of the things that we need to do is encourage this, this partnership and enhance it so that we can overcome these problems. Um, and uh, I still would like the village to be under the same rules that everybody else has and lead by example, not by exception. Yeah. Agreed. Um, they, uh, the rules should apply to everybody. Um, write tickets. That's the way to do it. But I've got to tell you, the leaf blower, <laughs> the leaf blower regulation is just one of many, many regulations that the board passes that they don't enforce, that aren't enforced, and they just seem to add things onto the list and uh, just hope that people will eventually figure it out or that the police will tell them to stop or whatever. Our parks departments, our, uh, our parks are filled with all sorts of rules that are completely ignored. And um, it's just not practical. I would like to see us pare back the number of restrictions we have in the parks uh, and uh, and enforce the things that we want, the the, the activities we want to uh, we want to control. Uh, that's it's that simple. And the leaf blowers that goes with that too. You got to write the tickets. We all have phones. Take a picture. We should be able to um, uh, identify the uh, the people who are using them and, uh, and 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 write a ticket. It's not uh, that hard if you make the effort to enforce it. But the problem is, it's easy to pass regulations regulations and just put, write them down in a book and forget about them. Uh, the actual um, uh, mechanism of government is, is harder than that and, and requires some uh, sense of purpose and, and, and some determination. And uh, we can issue instructions to these departments to, the, to just do it, take care of it. Right. Thank you. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Can you repeat the question oh, for me, sure. please? Thank you. What will you do to enforce the ban on the use of leaf blowers during the summer months, which is often ignored by local landscapers, homeowners, and at times the village of Mamaroneck? Thank you. 
I think first and foremost, we need to educate the people, educate our homeowners, educate the landscapers who are going and doing this work. They just need to be educated. If they're not, if we don't educate them on the on the issue on our rule of not having this done in the summer months, how can they be expected to follow that? The second thing I think that needs to be done is enforcement. Like Lou said, we have a lot of rules in our parks and that are just not enforced. It's just something that people know, like I'm gonna continue to do this and nothing's gonna happen. If we do not enforce these rules, people will never learn and they will continue to overstep and they will not stop using leaf blowers or doing certain things they're not allowed to do in the parks. So I think the two, the two solutions that we, or things I could propose that we would do is definitely figure out how to educate, whether it's a pamphlet, whether it's a flyer, newsletter, something to make it accessible for everybody to find it and know what to do, but then also enforcing and writing those tickets. People are gonna continue to overstep and think we are not going to force anything if we don't write tickets to solve any of these problems. Just like everybody else said, sitting here, in terms of education, educating the community and enforcing um, the laws that we do have already in place. But we wanna make sure that our laws, and if when we do educate, they are accessible language-wise, we need to make sure that everybody understands what we're asking of them. So by elim you know eliminating um, leaf blowers during the summer months, ensure in education in our in our emails in our in our um our our how we publicize ensure that everybody's able to understand what we're asking of them and just using possibly a a, a call in number and i believe dan stated like a call in number where people can call in and say somebody is going against the law or going against the policy and and un, unan, uh, un, what is it, unanimously I mean, so, yeah. huh? anonymous <laughs> An anonymous anonymously uh, anonymously <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thank you um the next question uh, first to we'll go first to mr spatz what specific actions and or policies do you support to increase voter engagement? Could you repeat that question again, please? Which, Thank you. Which specific actions and or policies do you support to increase voter engagement? I almost asked you a third time, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I think to engage this municipality that we're fortunate to call home, uh, call home, we, we have to, I think we're doing a very good job of that right now. I think this is an unprecedented time where literally I can say for myself, visiting and having the opportunity to encourage people to ask questions, be part of the process, irrespective of where you're gonna or how you're gonna vote, ask the right questions. Social media has been very, very useful in that regard. And the outreach on challenging individuals to come to meetings, to come to meet and greets, starting with our schools, middle schools, high schools, getting our youth involved. That is a paramount um, priority that we have to work on. Uh, most people didn't even know that there was a primary until we, when I'm saying all six of us up here start social, ooh, stop, okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, one more time. Sure. Uh, which specific actions and or policies do you support to increase voter engagement? I think voter engagement is, is a basic right, but people many times don't understand that it is their, not only a right, but their duty. And what we do is, I, I know what I do, is go out and meet with groups in all neighborhoods all the time uh, and walking the village, talking with people, trying to get the, engage them and get them to be engaged in whatever their particular concerns are or what they want to do to volunteer to offer uh, to help. 
that is, you know, the key to moving forward, you know, and bringing people together. Uh, you know, it, what is fascinating uh, to me is that numerous people have their own very specific issue. And many times people aren't willing li really to listen to them. I take the time to listen. I take the time to understand. I take the time to try and work with them so that they can understand the issues of how to, be, how to make it better or why we can't address a particular issue as quickly as they would like. Um, and, and it's a matter of inclusion in reaching out. Uh, and not, not only at our meetings, but going out and talking to people and finding out what their concerns are and talking to them because that's what get, gets them engaged and that's what translates to voting for people they want or don't want. First and foremost, I would synchronize our village elections with the federal schedule. It's been proposed by uh, the Maranac High School students who brought us a very good proposal and was rejected by the Board of Trustees. We should vote every two years with the feds. Right now, we have annual elections, and an off-year elections turnout is infinitesimal. Uh, you add that to the lack of um, primaries, and you're essentially handing your government, your village government, to a Democratic committee. Uh, I'd like to see elections every two years and primaries marries like this at every election cycle because this, folks, is healthy. Uh, this is um, democracy uh, replacing political gamesmanship that has uh, ruled this village for far too long. That's what I would do. And I would uh, outreach with a, the creation, of, since it's a Democratic primary, of a Democratic club to invite independents um, to join the Democratic Party. New Democrats. Um, um, uh, Mr. Spatz uh, is a new Democrat. He joined the party in in, only in February. Welcome, Andy. And, uh, and that's what we need. That's what we need here. Thank you. Um, I believe forums like this are, is the first, is one of the first steps to kind of re-engaging our voters to, you know, to, re, to increase voter engagement. However, that can't be the only way. A large part of our, of our community is not digitally connected. How can we only have digital forums? All our, all, for a while, our, all our board meetings were virtual. All I know, all committee meetings are virtual. How can we expect people to be engaged in our community if the only way they can get it is through a computer? That can't happen. So I think to, to really increase voter engagement, we need to look at other avenues to, kind of, to bring people together. Forums like this would be, are important, but it's one step. I think I also believe that you know, other community forums, like I know for flooding, I know we met together in uh, the village, of, in uh, the Washington area at St. Vito's and brought people together in person. I think we need to go back to in-person events to bring the community together. We cannot only do things digitally and expect engagement if people are not digitally connected. And that's the only way to bring all our voters together is in, through in-person event, through both parallel in-person events and virtual. I agree in regards to outreach. It's very important, as well as engaging all parties in communicating our community needs. Um, most people don't even, even myself, maybe a few years ago, did not even understand or even know about district leaders. Most people in our village don't even understand what a district leader's job is. So let alone understand what the board's responsibilities are, the committees. Some people just don't know. And if we're not helping in educating them on these things, how would they know even to volunteer? And sometimes people don't engage in volunteering because they don't feel safe in spaces or they don't feel that they are capable, not capable, but able to be in such spaces. So we tend to pick people or we tend to gravitate to only our friends, only other people that we know. Expand your horizons by engaging the entire community so that you can get a diverse, diverse set of thoughts, diverse set of ideals of what is best for our village. Um, and also, I would say that even myself, I was, I collaborated with CURE to start many conversations 
in the community just to hear the thoughts of the, the, the residents here. Because if we don't know, we don't know, and we can't grow our community if we don't know. Thank you. Mr. Lippman. Hey, thank you. Um, it's really an important question, uh, voter engagement. It brought me back to my youth, uh, growing up in the projects in the Bronx. Um, people didn't want to vote because they felt that if you voted, you'd get called to jury duty. <laughs> now, of course, the truth is the list comes from many different sources, not nothing to do with voting. But what, what I did learn was that there was a real communications network within the community. And if I had been older rather than a kid, I might have used that to some political advantage. But as I, as I grew older in high school, I, I made phone calls for candidates and I eventually got involved in politics and ended up with a career in government. The one thing I learned is that you have to tell the truth to people and you have to try to get them involved in the decision making. You can't thrust your opinion upon people. You have to seek out their opinion and try to effectuate policy based on that. And that's why voter engagement is so important. Okay, thank you. And um, we are running out of time, so that was our final question. We will begin the closing statements. Before we do, I want to once again thank the candidates and thank our timekeeper. And um, as we stated at the beginning, we will begin, we will end as we began. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. That's right. Back, back to the original order. Thank you. So go. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you had anything else to say. I want to be respectful. <laughs> All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen and all those who are watching and we all have a choice to make and at the end of this ch at the end of the choice is yours i am running as an individual but i made a conscious decision to run with two amazing human beings who think on their own who can listen and communicate effectively and are true advocates for people. I made this decision because I possess those qualities. I am a person of true integrity, something that I was taught at a very young age. We have been afforded a lot of things in life, and in this last two years, I believe one of the greatest gifts we received is the ability to see the world from a different view and to create change we want to see. The time was always now, but it is more than apparent because our lives and livelihoods depend on it. As stated in the beginning, I would like to thank each person watching and the League of Women Voters for hosting and these five gentlemen who have decided to sit with me, a young black woman willing and ready to take this leap of faith to do what is best for the entire community. Okay, thank you. I, I almost don't know where to start because we covered so much ground tonight. Um, I'm very proud to have been a participant and I'm very glad I had the opportunity to run in this race. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my, my partners, the experienced team of Spatz and Natchez and Littman. What, what we're bringing to it is diverse backgrounds and a real commitment to public service and years and years, too many years of, of experience. Um, I've always been a firm believer that government should facilitate, not obstruct. And when you have a uh, weak mayor form of government, uh, yeah, it's very different than New York City. Um, but government in this system is closer to the people. And you need to perform. You need to act on behalf of your constituents and make progress and work for the betterment of the community, and that's what we're trying to do. So we hope for your support uh, June 28th. Thank you. So this past weekend I saw Hamilton. I thought I would wrap my debate, but clearly that wasn't going to happen. But I'll use one quote 
from this past weekend. Winning is easy, governing is hard. As the learning curve is unforgiving given the stakes, these unprecedented times require the ability to engage all members of this exceptional, exceptional community with understanding, civility, and respect. I will continue to run my campaign with the same ethos and integrity that inspires us all to rise above the negativity and focus on the serious issues at hand. My experience, perseverance, and desire to seek common ground through inclusiveness and transparency will provide strength and vitality to our community. I ask you, Mamaronek, to give me the opportunity to advocate for a better village and equally as important to listen to the needs and concerns of the community so that we may traverse these challenging times together and do so with professionalism and dignity to promote the thriving and representative local government that you deserve. This evening, I challenge everyone sitting up here on this dais to set aside our differences and work together for a better Mamaronek. I know I will, whether elected or resuming my presence on the many, many civic-based committees and commissions I serve here in the village of Mamaronek and the Sound Shore. I thank everyone here tonight and much luck in the future. Thank you. Mr. Natchez. Again, I want to thank the League for this opportunity and most importantly, you, our residents, for listening. An informed voter en enhances our village. We need to continue to work to become more flood resilient, work with the Army Corps of Engineers to tweak the project to make it as effective as possible. We must continue to clear our rivers, change our laws to encourage raising houses out of the flood water elevations, and stop the overdevelopment of flood prone areas that puts our residents and first responders at risk. We must continue to refurbish and improve our infrastructure as outlined in our capital budget using grants from New York and federal governments where possible. As a lifelong resident, president of award-winning environmental waterfront design company with an MBA and background in finance, I understand the meaning of budgeting and not playing games to stay under the cap. We must run our government in the same way we handle our households and business budgets without exception. We must make our village more affordable to retain our diversity, which is being threatened for all of our residents, including our seniors and working families. And we need a better communication between staff, residents, and treat all residents fairly, honestly, professionally, concentrating on the issues of the message, not the messenger. And we need to bring back friendly to the village, work together, and not engage in negative, baseless allegations and innuendos. The time for inaction has ended. We live in a village blessed with tremendous resources, but in the past, those resources have been squandered and opportunities lost. Flood mitigation languished. Our village hall deteriorated. Our infrastructure crumbled, while our board of trustees immersed itself in vanity politics, quixotic lawsuits filed by friends and supporters, and personal grudges against the mayor and the village manager. Policy became paralyzed. A proposed comprehensive development plan was completed in 2019. It gathers dust. A building moratorium stretched on and on while the board failed to find a consensus on a path forward, and the floods came again and again again and again, and expressions of concern from the board seem to lack a certain sense of urgency. I have brought that sense of urgency back to the Board of Trustees and now want to give our mayor a policy-making board that he and the village manager can work with. A new board will give the manager direction by speaking as one and not squabbling among themselves. Mayor Tom Murphy asked me to consider running for this trustee, uh, for trustee late last year, and early this year appointed me to the job when Kelly Wenstrup moved away. I've looked under the hood of this vehicle and I choose to stand with my running mates, Lelani Yeiser Reed and Manny Rawlings, because I believe they represent a future of action. We don't have all the answers, but we know how to listen and communicate, and we're certain that inaction and paralysis offer nothing. And since I have a little time left, I want to uh, say that I think uh, we should put some senior exercise equipment in the parks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I forgot. Mr. Rawlings. Uh, I want to thank again the League of Women Voters, LMC Media, and everybody who tuned in tonight. I also want to thank Mayor Tom Murphy for his endorsement. Mayor has made me who I am. I'm, a, you know, and my mission is to continue to serve that community. 
with the goal, with the goal of preferring its strengths and long-term diversity. I, I firmly believe it's time to pass that baton on to fresh faces new with, that will bring new ideas and to, re, to revamp and push our village forward. I'm asking for your support, for not just for me, but for my running mates Leilani, Yajarid, and Lou Young. There's no more time for inaction. You know, we plan to bring a fresh perspective on flooding through personal experience, safer streets, and good governance. The, area, the era of obstruction is over. I want to leave you with this. We are three generations running to serve one village. Thank you. Um, again, thank everyone for their participation, and uh, please vote in the upcoming primary.